is going on? I want to welcome you from Half Court for today, August 16th, 2023. Apparently, according to Troy, it's the halfway point of the NBA offseason. I want to die. I'm Sean Murphy alongside my guy, Jeff I afraid. Jeff, how you feeling, man? Week one Alliance preseason in the books. At least we got some football coming back into our lives a little bit. I mean, obviously with basketball struggling, you know, you couldn't pay your rent at the mansion. So you're still out in the alley. How are you holding up, man? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was at the Lions uh, preseason win. Uh, you know, preseason, you know, that's big time right now. We're starving for football, so I take what I can get. Preseason win, you know, I, may, did we overanalyze it? Absolutely. But this is the part of the year where I'm excited for. So, yeah, yeah uh, the Pistons put me out in the alley, but hopefully the Lions this year can get me back in the mansion. So, you know, we just got to, you know, we're, we're giving and taking. But I'm excited. There is, there is literally only one thing I took away from that from that game, and it was it was kind of what we already knew from training camp. That Brian Branch guy can play, like like that's where I'm at. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, like, he, like, he can. That that dude can hit for sure. Yeah, one hundred percent. But also joining us is the man, the myth, the legend, the six three heat from Marquette, Michigan. It is. Troy. Thanks for ruining my day. I, I I thought we were getting close to basketball being back, and you were like, did you know it's the halfway point between the NBA Finals and the regular season? And now I'm all pissy. How are you? I'm doing good, Sean. I, I told you that as good news because the Finals <laughs> weren't that long ago, and I was trying to make you happy, but uh, apparently uh, that, that didn't uh, succeed. But, hey, one of my A day without players... basketball is a bad day for yeah, Sean, okay? I... Can, we just, can we just establish that? One of my favorite players that you normally say in my intro, Dirk, uh, had his Hall of Fame speech the other day. That was yeah, good stuff. Yeah, man. Uh, happy about that. But also, you asked me a question last week I couldn't answer. You said, what do you think about Jordan Love and your Packers? And uh, a little more on the optimistic side, but still not uh, all in yet. Um, you guys, I'll just you say it, Troy. He's mid. <laughs> and that's okay. He's yeah, mid. I mean, like, he's not Aaron Rodgers, but we didn't right. expect him to be. We didn't expect him to, but we have some good wide receivers. We have a good running game. Um, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. If we can squeeze out at least seven, maybe even eight games, I'm happy. Um, yeah. yeah. Beat Let's the Lions say, once. Let's just say the Cheeseheads have a few more holes in it this season. That's all I'm going to say. But, yeah. but, but hey, you could still be – I mean, you're the Packers. You'll figure it out. You know what I mean? But, out, man. Yeah, as, as much as we hate to admit that, right? But this ain't from, from the 50-yard line. God – Dang it, it's from half court. Reaching every week, we talk all things NBA basketball, all things Detroit Pistons. If you like that, be sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the content. When the season comes back around, I promise you the uploads are coming back in full force. But also, be sure you follow all of us on social media. You can find us on X, at Sean Half Court, at Jeff Biafrady, and at Troy Sergi. 44 again that's on x <laughs> way to way to kill one of the best Terrible. brands in social media elon musk get more on anyway let's talk about basketball because that's what we're here to do we i i said this on the back on on the podcast last week and i kind of felt reaffirmed by what the pistons tweeted earlier today um i talked about how are we forgetting that monty williams and Cade Cunningham are going to be together this season. The fact that, you know, as we begin to, you know, try to turn the corner, we get to do so with not only one of the best developmental minds of basketball, but one of the best coaches in basketball, period. Like, October can't come soon enough. Like, with that, it just gets me excited and curious about what Monty's going to be able to bring to this team. You know, the changes – that, that we can expect because I know, you know, I know around the time that he was hired, you know, we, we, you know, we speculated at nauseum about what this team could look like, but now some of the pieces are actually starting to come together. Now we know who they drafted at fifth overall. Now we know what they did in free agency. And quite frankly, now we know how good Cade looks. So there's like a lot of reasons to believe, you know, going into this season, like Monty Williams, isn't going 
you know, isn't going into a shootout firing blanks. Like he mm-hmm. has some real ammunition and firepower. And I would argue, like you look at the season when Phoenix turned the corner, you know, like like Monty came in, they won like like 15 or 16 more games, I believe it was. I would argue that Cade is a more complete player at this point than Devin Booker was during that stretch. So for me, it's like, are we under underestimating what this group can do? Like, are like, is it just blatantly disrespectful to automatically call this team a bottom three team in the East or a bottom three team in the league? Because like, I think there's a lot of reasons to not, you know, to, to not feel comfortable playing the Pistons on a night to night basis now. Yeah, and I think that narrative of, you know, you come off last year, you're still considered one of those teams. So there's that point of they have to prove it. But at the same time, to your point, Sean, it's hard to put a a cap on a team that has so much youth, but guys with a ton of upside. And you can't really project any of these guys. I mean, Kate, we have an idea, but still, it's hard putting a ceiling. We have expectations, I think 30 wins, but still to say they're one of the worst teams right now, I think it's just that, yeah, last year they were one of the worst teams. But only Pistons fans really know the context behind those games. Like nationally, it's like, hey, that team won 17 games. Now there's a lot more that goes into it, and now you have a respected head coach. I mean, not saying Dwayne wasn't, but now a guy that has real cachet right now in the NBA, highest paid coach, by the way. So there you go. There's reason to be excited. And I think from, you know, you look at a stable organization from the top down, the Pistons are checking those boxes. I mean, Troy Weaver respected, at least from our perspective. I know people were hating on him last year, but overall, we're all happy with Troy. Monty's proven what he's proven, even down to your franchise player. And Cade Cunningham, we all, you know, we expect, and he's gotten a lot of respect in this league. So there's real reason to be excited. But, you know, I, although I wouldn't say you, you should put a cap on this team, I think also there is that part of it where it's like, you know, you, you can't have too big of expectations. But right. this team, I think, is going to surprise a lot of people. I do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Troy, I don't, I don't think it's ridiculous at all to say, that the Pistons are in a position to where they could improve by 15 or 16 wins. You know, like that is something, you know, that, that I think they're able to do, especially if Monty can come in, have that type of impact that we know that he can have. And if we know that Cade's looking awesome from day one, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to believe that this, you know, that this could get pretty, you know, this could get pretty lethal pretty quickly. It's going to take time, but at the same time, they could be competitive fast. Right. Absolutely. And Jeff, you know, said certainly how, you know, we have a young team like this and it's really hard to put a cap with these young guys, but also it's hard to put a cap with a proven coach. You know, as we know, a lot of these guys, we have, we have no idea their full, full potential. And that includes a Cade Cunningham and a Jaden Ivey and a Jalen Duran and uh, Monty Williams. We know that he's a coach of the year kind of guy. We know that he is a proven guy that he turns franchises around. Who's to say he can't turn around arcs, especially with this young core, especially with how much Tom Gores and Troy Weaver believes in him. I think that goes uh, a long ways itself, too. So, yeah, I mean, you put the two together. I mean, you add 15 wins to that 17. You, you got 32, right? Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, that's not that's not too, too crazy, Sean. Um, I, I certainly think we'll be over 25. Well- I, I can say that pretty confident. And Sean, they gave this man a six-year contract. Like we talk about what they could do next season, but what about the yeah. season after that? And the Look season eight, after this that? is a long-term game, right. way eight, more than it yes. is a eight, So eight years with Monty Williams. Like, yeah, there's. Uh, it's not just this upcoming season, but for the future, it's. We have them locked is at, not next year. We have them locked at the minimum through twenty twenty-nine. He's 2029. He's our coach. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. there. Yeah, 100%. And, and, and with that, you know, he you know he's going to have the autonomy, you know, to build the program that he wants to build. Obviously, you know, they've given him, you know, a lot of a lot of power and a lot of influence coming into the organization. But, you know, at, at the same time, you know, the fact that he's come in, you know, embraced where the program is at, you know, with with the restoration, you know, concept. I mean, as far as like on the court. What do you think like the biggest difference is that people can expect? Because even though like I, th- I think it's important again to reemphasize that, you know, this isn't the NFL where, you know, where they're going to bring in this drastically, you know, different scheme where it's going to be like, we're going from a, from a motion offense to, you know, to like an air raid, you know what I mean? It's not going to be that type of change, but right. having said that there are elements that Monty Williams, you know, brings, you know, we talked about the, you know, the, the, the three seconds or less, you know, offense, you know, like making a, making snap decisions, you know, his his abilities, 
you know, in the high pick and roll screens and some of the the, the uh, concepts that he does have. But again, this isn't the NFL where I, where it's drastically different. However, he is going to bring an impact. What do you guys think that'll look like? I think the impact is going to be the development of our young guys. I mean, we're, we're saying that already, but I, I just feel like what we saw from these guys as rookies and uh, I guess even slightly a second year Cade, just for the little bit that we saw him uh, in the first 12 games of last year. I just feel like there's just so much growth. And I think being that father figure for these guys is going to be important too. I think being there for these guys off the court is going to be just as important as on the court, having that mentor uh, ship relationship with some of these guys. So I just feel like we're going to see young men become men right i, I just yeah. feel like i feel like that's going to be the what uh the goal and what we're going to see out of monty williams and um you know play styles adding adding things to their arsenal um limiting turnovers of ivy higher shot percentage maybe duran can get in the 70s to low 80s in the free throw range you know there's just so many little things that we don't think about but with the culture of a coach believing you mentoring you encouraging you having the right training i, I just feel like there's just so much there to offer this young yeah, I mean, you look at a, a fresh set of eyes, which is which is huge for these guys. I mean, you have Dwayne Casey, yeah. and although we can talk about you – know, people can talk about X's and O's all they want. You can't question his character. You can't question what he's meant to these players. So I, I think for Monty, he brings a similar mold to what Dwayne brought as like a player to – for a player to coach relationship, but also he adds a fresh set of eyes, um, a modern day offense, in my opinion. And I think somebody that still has a relationship dating back to his early days coaching – relating to players like people I mean, the players have came out and talked about their relationship with Monty Williams and not only that he's had success with guards so there's a lot of things that I think fit with both the Pistons and Monty but um, the thing that I don't get I don't think gets lost between Dwayne and Monty is that relationship I think Dwayne being there's huge but Monty is is just one of the guys and, and again it's it's gonna be great yeah 100 and you know I, I I do think you know Ultimately, like the 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 transition being as smooth as it is with with you know Dwayne still being in the building, but also bringing in a coach you know who carries an equal you know like who has like a similar cachet and and reputation in the league. But I think the you know the significant difference being you know Monty just went to the finals two years right. ago. He has a long list of you know like as, as many great players as Dwayne Casey has coached. I mean, Monty Williams has been integral in the success of, of the likes of Devin Booker, Chris Paul. You know, he, he's been able to coach some of the best players in the game. And, you know, I, I, I think, you know, on top of that, the, you know, the fact that he's going to be able to come in, like he's going to expect, you know, excellent day one. And so I think where Dwayne was kind of asked to be, you know, to, to be the developmental eye, to really, you know, be that patient hand the one that really guides them through those first couple of years to the league. I think this is going to be, you know, I think you're going to still get a lot of that emotion, a lot of that, you know, like, like Monty Williams is very much a player's coach, 100%. But at the same time, he's going to, he's going to expect a lot from you. And if you're not giving to, if you're not giving it to him, I don't think he's going to be nearly as patient as Dwayne this season and bringing them off the court. So Mm -hmm. like, that's why, you know, when you that that is why when you hear names like when we talk so much about guys like Killian and really wonder like what their future looks like, it's because we wonder where the patience level is going to be day one, right? Yeah, it almost basically it basically raises competition level because it's a it's not what Dwayne's relationship with these players that that's all that stays within house, but still Monty doesn't. I mean, he's familiar with some of these guys, but all of it's new, so they're gonna have to re they're basically earn his trust each player to player. So it's you know it's it's also raises competition. It's a fresh set of eyes, but also it's like hey. I'm just meeting most of you for the first time. Like I'm now Cade's the franchise. Clearly there's guys that already have a, a role for themselves, but Killian Hayes, for example, like he, he has a chance maybe to have a, a new start or Monty at this point's like, nah, this ain't going to work. Like, like you said, Sean, it's higher expectations, but again, that's the stuff you want. You want more pressure, especially when you get a guy like Monty Williams and you pay that much mm-hmm. money and you have the roster they do. I mean, you're going to have to take a jump. So it, it, I think it's a great thing. What Monty brings to this, to this team, it's, it's much needed. No, yeah. Part. I- I, I, I think if anyone was the most excited after seeing how Cade did at Team USA Select and how Cade performed, you know, throughout these initial runs, it's got to be Monty. I mean, even though it was like difficult for Monty to leave Phoenix, you know, he very much married himself to that situation. He was able to, you know, coach 
great players and, and, and great minds like Devin Booker, like Chris Paul, you know, high character guys like Mikhail Bridges and Cam Johnson, even in his time there. But coming to Detroit, he gets to very much see through that footage, you know, what we've seen with Cade, but also what we've seen out of Duran, what we've seen in the flashes out of Ivy, what we saw in Summer League out of Asar Thompson. By right. no means is he going to a situation with a with a significant talent downgrade. Now, is it going to be is it going to be the same level day one? Absolutely not. But I do. Th- but do I think he can build a program just as good, if not better, in Detroit? Absolutely, I do. Well, and we've been talking about the devel- uh, the, de- the developmental aspect of this with Monty, but what about the attraction he has for free agents? Like for a guy like Monty, going to play for a guy like Monty, I mean, a coach selecting a coach is also part of that free agency process. So everything he has also with the guys developing him, there's also that point of view for it's like, hey, you have Monty Williams, guys like Cam Johnson. You were in the conversation with him, it, it, even though he was resigning with Brooklyn. But the reason why – is because of Monty Williams and the Pistons and Troy Weaver, but that relationship he already had prior with Cam Johnson. So, you know, the developmental stuff's great, but also, man, this is now becoming slowly, not yet, but it'll start becoming more of a free agency, you know, destination with good players, right? Cade, Ivy, these guys, Duran, but also Monty Williams. And, and I think that's going to gonna help the Pistons out in the future um, as, as more free agency classes open up and you get more money available, but we shall see. Yeah, I think they can be very, you know, I think they, it can be very similar to, you know, what Indiana just did was signing a guy like Bruce Brown, right? Like, you know, yes, obviously they paid a premium and that's one of the main reasons why he was there. But also at the same time, it's because of the prospect of pay- playing with Tyrese Halliburton and basketball wise, the fit he can be there, right? Like similarly, I think Detroit will be in that position, you know, to go and get those types of players as soon as the, as soon as the deadline, I could even right. argue. Right. But and those same- are the types of players that have the, that finals experience that I think is going to be helpful too. Because I mean, there's plenty of great vets. I mean, Bogey's a guy that we love and we talk about. But getting some of those guys who have been key uh, players and uh, contributed in key moments in the biggest situation that you can in the basketball world, and that is the NBA Finals, those are the guys that I think you really want, especially if you're playing for a play-in push or, for all we know, potentially maybe even a playoff push. Um, that's those are the guys that we're looking for, I think, and then those are the guys that Monty can help uh, develop as well, and and Monty can help coach because Monty himself has been in some of those key playoff situations as well. Um, yeah, he's been in the finals himself. So, yeah, absolutely. Now, speaking of players that you want in key situations, James Harden. James Harden was in China uh, on his on his China tour chore with Adidas. And over the weekend, we had gotten some news, uh, some reports that the Philadelphia 76ers uh, no longer were shopping James Harden and were planning on bringing him back for the upcoming season. Now, anyone that has been a follower of, of James Harden or is familiar with his game, both on the court and in the, in the front office, knows that James Harden wasn't going to take that laying down. And today, when I tell you that even James Harden found a way to surprise me, like, like that is saying something. Like, I thought I'd seen it all. And then there's this. Uh, Daryl Morey is a liar, and I will never be a part of the emerging tradition of my easy Let me say that again. Let me say that again. (laughs) My favorite thing about that is like, imagine being one of those kids that's like, oh my gosh, James Harden. And he's just like, Daryl Morey's a liar. He's a scumbag. I will never play for his team. And they're like, and a lot of those kids have never like, seen why, an NBA how player. Do you in that situation. Yeah, and he did say, never, "Let me say it again." After yeah, that as well, they've never seen an NBA player before or had any type of NBA experience. I mean, we take it for granted that we can go to games and whatever. But yeah, I mean, that's that's their forever NBA uh, moment. James Harden comes to China. <laughs> oh my gosh! And then did you see James Harden with the moped? I did not. Oh my gosh, this man, I, this man, like when you talk about like the Mount Rushmore of not giving a, this guy might be, he might 
be the Mount Rushmore, dude. This guy literally out like right before a game in China. Just riding around the court on a moped. <laughs> Why? Why is this? Happening? What is this he's, world? he's out there living his best life. And then he ain't done. Like this guy's a freaking menace, man. Yeah, he's he he's out there living his best life right now. Yeah, one hundred percent. Daryl Morey. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. But guys, when we talk about the fact that we now have Daryl Morey and James Harden publicly beefing. When yeah. Daryl Morey was probably the biggest advocate that James Harden had in this league. Is it fair to say beyond this year, what in the world is this guy's future in the league? Yeah, definitely. Like, like, is it, like is it extreme to be is it extreme to be wondering how long until James is gonna have to stay in China? Like, like, is that ridiculous? No, no, that is he ain't playing in old China. He he's too damn. Are you good. telling me within five years he won't be playing in China? <laughs> five, okay, one. maybe five, but not two or three. No, no, number one, I I don't think his ego would let him play in China, but I don't think he he's gonna be that bad to where he has to play in China. Are you kidding me? If anything, that's where his ego might be saved. Uh, he, if he goes like, and puts I up, I want to be a game. role player in the NBA. He could still go be the star. Like st- he could go get a statue, like Stephon Marbury. <laughs> Okay, okay. And for the, the James Harden stuff, like although James Harden has been, you know, he, he's been an interesting uh story to follow in the NBA. Uh, I, I will I'm say ju- I'm whole, just joking, by the way. He's the a high quality basketball well, player. I don't it, want I don't want it to be known that I'm saying he's going to China. No, That's not, I, it, I'm not I, I know that. you you weren't directly saying that, but I'm for just heavily who, implying it. No, the I'm people kidding. who are coming at James Harden, like I don't know all the details of what Daryl Morey, I know Kyrie Irving tweeted about it or he responded to Woj. But like him saying this about Daryl Morey, I don't think, and obviously a lot of players, this is a leverage play for James Harden. You go out to the public, you speak to people, you get this out there that Daryl Morey's a, you know, a, apparently now he's a terrible human being. I don't know all the details, but you know there might be some truth to that, maybe a false promise or or something. I mean, Daryl Morey might be a scumbag. I don't know, but also James Harden has shown parts of his career where he hasn't been the greatest uh, person either. So it, right. you know, it's just it's a funny story though. I, I love it. Well, yeah. and it's interesting you bring up the Daryl Morey side of it. Go ahead, real quick, Troy. I'm gonna. I'm no, gonna I was bring gonna say to you. you mentioned uh, you know what his future is in the league, and I just I just don't know what's next. I think that's where my head is focusing on in this situation of okay, he probably um, isn't gonna get traded to the Clippers, even though that's where he's publicly said because I don't know if the Clippers have the assets. But he also, like you mentioned before we got on, and I would love to hear you talk a little more about this, but the CBA elements to this too of he can't just leave he can't right, right just show up to train uh not show up to training camp right um so he well, can't pull ben simmons well because i mean here's the interesting wrinkle that started this all that i think is somehow still getting lost in translation a little bit james harden opted in to his contract i get that he and, and, and listen it's pretty clear why because that was the only way he was going to get that type of money this upcoming season. But in the same light, it's a little hard to feel sympathetic for a player when they completely gave up all of their control like a month and a half ago. But what do you think there's a, a an angle to this where Daryl Morey promised he would he would seek a trade for James if he opted in? And maybe when he opted in, he said, yeah, we're, we're going to keep you. Like, do you think there's a part of that? Maybe he's frustrated. I, 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 I could see that being a thing, but I'm more so led to believe that this is that this is about contract stuff. And and the reason why I feel that way is earlier today, uh, Woj tweeted an article, you know, about the incident in China, and Kyrie Irving replied and gave us an interesting nugget, saying, "Wait, wait, whoa, whoa. Not- what's his what, what what's his username? Chief Chief Hella? We listen, man. We." Like we we just don't we like Kyrie yeah, is just an enigma uh, okay. in his own light. Hey. He, that guy, like whatever he's off doing off. Like I am no longer 
paying attention to Kyrie Irving off the court. You don't I even follow only, him, Sean. What's that? You don't even follow him. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, here's what he here's what he had to say. Is he disgruntled, Adrian? Or is he holding Daryl Morey accountable for his dishonesty and lack of transparency throughout the contract negotiation process this summer? Now, that would lead credence to this, you know, to kind of the, the concept and, you know, kind of like what we all thought James was, was thinking going into this summer was it seemed like he was expecting a big contract either from the Houston Rockets or the Philadelphia 76ers. And I think pretty quickly he found out that the, uh, that his options were far more limited than that. And, you know, like, I, I, I think like, yes, uh, you know, like I, I, I think ultimately, you know, if, if Daryl Morey did indeed, you know, like make a promise that wasn't kept, like, I think ultimately that like there will be like consequences for that. But I think it's going to be long, long term ramifications. Like, for example, like if 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 you're really getting me to speculate, I wouldn't be worried about James Harden with all of this. I'd be worried about Joel Embiid and what he's thinking and how he's feeling, because there is no shot in hell that he is that he is feeling encouraged going into the season. Right with this type of, with another disgruntled teammate, like, like oh another Ben Simmons situation. He Again. deserves, he deserves a, a true uh, second option on that team, a true star, a true co-star to be with him. And um, unfortunately we know Ben Simmons wasn't that guy. And we are quickly, very quickly finding out James Harden wasn't either, but also well, like, and here's the thing, because, Troy, go ahead. Really quick. Sorry to interrupt because this is what pisses me off. They had him in the building. They had the star. Jimmy Butler was a Philadelphia 76er. That tandem would have been the one. If it was going to happen in Philly, it was going to happen with Jimmy Butler and Joel Embiid. And you know what they chose instead? Simmons. Tobias Harris. Oh, right, right, with the max deal. Yeah, yeah. They chose to sign Tobias Harris over Jimmy Butler. Mm. Like, 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 you could just go down the list. This has just been failure after failure after failure after failure. And yes, Dale, Mur Dale Morey is one of the brightest minds of basketball. He is. One of the most clever negotiators. He's great at making trades. He's great at, at, at creating cap space out of thin air. But guys, how much do we talk about the fact that basketball isn't played on paper? Right. That you're dealing with real human beings with real emotions. And if you want players to be bought into your team, you have to do right by them. Now, granted, I'd say if anyone's done right by James Harden ever it's Daryl Morey but at the same time obviously seems like James Harden feels like he's been wrong it will be but but here's the other thing at this point what choice does James Harden have yeah no he he doesn't have a ton of leverage for at least the money he's going to be commanding or the money he's looking to make like the right. Philly opting in was was the best option for him now you know, it's kind of ironic that Kyrie comes at his defense because it, it goes back to when James was in Brooklyn. It felt like James was kind of witnessing destruction all around him with Kyrie and the Brooklyn Nets. And then he gets out of there. And now he's going through his similar situation with management with the 76ers. Now Joel Embiid's kind of the James Harden in this situation where he's kind of like, you know what? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if I want to continue to, to be here. Like, I don't know if this is an option for me. So right, I, and I he hasn't great. said that yet, but that's coming, right? Like, yes. Like, like that, it, it, it goes back to your point about the Jimmy Butler. Like this, I think this has been brewing for, for quite some time. Like, yeah. I, I don't think it would just be the James Harden, but I don't know. That might be the, the uh, might be the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. I mean, it's a domino effect, right? Like, you know, decisions you make, you know, four or five years ago will dictate your future. If those are the wrong decisions. Right. Right. Like I think if the Clippers could go back and and renege that whole uh, Paul George trade, I think they I think they would certainly 
consider hitting that button if they could, right? Oh, like, yeah. you know, like you know, just yeah. And, and and one last thing with with this whole situation, just to really emphasize how how screwed James Harden is, because un, un, unless he's traded, like unless he somehow forces his way out, he has to show up. He he can't just hold out a training camp like he says he's going to, because this is right from the CBA. Withholding services. A player who withholds playing services called for by a player contract for more than 30 days after the start of the last season covered by his player contract shall be deemed not to have completed his player contract by rendering the playing services called for there under. Accordingly, such a player shall not be a veteran free agent and shall not be entitled to negotiate or sign a player contract with, let me emphasize this, any other professional basketball team, not another NBA team, any professional basketball team, period, unless and until the team for which the player last played expressly agreed otherwise. So, guys, it, they not only do they have James Harden by the beard, they have James Harden by the balls. At, I, I said that joke before, and they said I had to say it again. I thought that was a pretty funny way no, to say you, it. No, you, you nailed that joke. And they do. I mean, at this point, they technically they do. The beard, the balls. Uh, I, I mean, it is what it is. And they have it pretty hard. The beard, the balls. Pretty hard in, yeah. <laughs> They got Driving they got that grip pretty hard in. So you know what it, it is what it is. But for for James he, for James Harden, it seems like a lose lose at this point. Like you want to make the most money you can, and he's in a pretty good situation. But also, you know, if Daryl Morey's a a liar as he says again, I don't know the details. Then I, he doesn't really have a ton of leverage, and no one's going to trade for that guy. Con- I mean, he's on a one year deal at this point, but still, what is it? Thirty six mil. What's what's the player option he's, he opted into? Yeah, about thirty-six million dollars. Yeah, I mean, and and James has still you know some to give, but I don't know what the market he'd be commanding. That's that that's the problem. And how many situations would want to bring in a guy like James, who right or wrong, seems to be in the media more so than not, uh, typically over being unhappy or things off the court. So it, you know, he he doesn't have a ton of leverage at this point. Philly yeah, might be the best I, destination. Right, and that's what I was saying earlier. I'm just so curious to know what the next move is because. He probably shouldn't have said. I mean, he has to know about the CBA agreement. He has to know about what you just brought up, Sean, yeah. about um, you know not reporting thirty days, can't play, play professional basketball. And he still chooses to have that language, which really shows he wants out of Philly. Which okay, he wants out of Philly, but how is that going to happen? Um, to be continued in uh, this season's episode of the NBA. Uh, well, so. well, they answer your question, Troy. Woj reported earlier about James Harden's agenda. And apparently his goal is to make the Sixers so uncomfortable that they just decide that they cannot bring him back. So when I say that we haven't even gotten to the tip of the iceberg of how ugly this situation could get, I am telling you, we we do not underestimate how uncomfortable James Harden is willing to make this. We've seen the man in, in the preseason in Houston a couple years ago. If anyone should be familiar with these tactics, it's Daryl Morey. Right. But I mean, you know, we'll see how it plays out. All, all I know is I, I know I'm glad I'm not the team dealing with this. That's for right, sure. Right. Any, any, per, oh, well, not just necessarily predictions, but like what franchise Sean out of the other 29, that's not, Philly, Philly, do you think would be a good fit with this guy at this stage of his career as far as what he can contribute to a basketball team and with the contract that he has? I think the only team that would make sense for him and for the league at this point, it, it'd have to be the Clippers. Like, if, if there's a team that, that has to be desperate enough to and needs to make something drastic happen, in order to have a shot to be contenders again. Because even though they are a formidable duo, even though when healthy, those guys are, you know, are are great. 
But I mean, again, when are they healthy? And also, even when they're at their best, are they better than Denver? Can they stop Jokic? I don't think so. So like the only way that that team's getting over the hump, turning the corner and, and really, you know, getting to where they want to go is if they can add just one more little burst of star power, just one more dynamic creator. And 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 you could maybe get some more consistency because Harden, you know, say you will about him, he does deal with injuries on occasion. He's generally pretty available when he wants to be, right? Right. But at the same time, do I think it's going to do I think it would work out? Absolutely not. That locker room would be terrible. No, so, no. You, the touches. I mean, it's a it's a three man war between PG, um, Kawhi, and then Harden. I mean, how do you even yeah. drop an offensive play and then, without like, one of them getting upset? And then, like, other than that, you go to like the wild card teams. What, what like, about what about the market for a team, or at least for James, for teams that don't uh, uh, land Damian Lillard? Could that be a possibility? If you miss out on Damian and you can't get a deal done for him, could you pivot to James? Mm. I, I know Miami would catch themselves dead before doing that. But, um, you know, I, I, I it, it's interesting because I, I think when you look at that situation, I don't think there's many buyers in the Damian w- Lillard world either. Because, I mean, you can't have your agent calling teams going, hey, he's not going to play here. He doesn't want to be here. And then expect, even though the league sent a memo saying that's not true, like he, he, he'd have to play anywhere, but teams lining up around the corner to give up all their assets, assets to go risk, you know, a, a, for all intents and purposes, you know, a, a rental for a guy that, you know, wouldn't necessarily want to be there. Right. Like, I, I think it, it's interesting. I think both are, you know, both don't have many destinations. I think the difference is, I think if anyone is going, like anyone has the cachet to actually get them where they want to go, I think it's Dame. Mm-hmm. Right, and, and I guess with that same question, you know, guys, is you know, Sean. I'm mean, sorry, Jeff. You brought up the word rental, or Sean, you brought up the word rental. When you guys just yeah. rental, um, yeah, I, I brought it up. I brought, you brought it up rental. Sorry, sorry. Um, what teams are interested in rental players? Because rental players aren't very sexy. But of course, we can all claim to 2019 that a, a, a rental player won a championship for an organization. So, I mean, is there any team looking to play that game of rental? I don't think so. Like, I really right. don't. I'm kind of with you there. Like, I think I think in the new CBA, I don't think anyone's looking to take, you know, like to, to take any significant risks unless they believe and get it can get them to a championship. You don't like again. The only team where it's worth to take that kind of leap is is the Clippers. Because you've already given up your, your, like the majority of your assets anyway. What's what's a Terrence man at this point? You know right. what I mean? But that's right. the problem. Philly wants if Philly wants to do that trade, they're gonna say, okay, Paul George, let's go. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and the Clippers are not doing that in any reality. So I mean it, you know, that that's where you get the standstill right now. And again, that's where it's gonna be, yeah. you know, that's where it's gonna be fascinating. And, you know, again. If we've seen anyone that's willing to, you know, if we've seen anyone that's willing to let situations get uncomfortable, both in the front office and in the locker room, it's Daryl Morey and it's James Harden. It feels like we're, it feels like we're watching the NBA equivalent of succession playing out right in front of our eyes. It's pretty fascinating. Is it not? That's why I love the NBA. Yeah, 100%. Guys, before we wrap it up, I did want to bring up a couple things. One, Talked about Anthony Davis's massive contract. We did. We did last week. Last yeah. week. Okay. Okay. Good. Because I just, I just still can't get the sixty million dollars per year <laughs> wow. to him out, out of my head. I, I just had to make sure that was brought up. In that case, let's end the episode talking about some Team USA basketball. I, I, I'm wondering, have you guys, you know, seen any clips? Seen anything of, of the team so far? I mean, you know, they had a pretty close competitive game against Spain. The other day, um, you know, overall, like first impressions, I mean, this isn't going to be, you know, the same World Cups of the past where the United States is clearly way better than everyone else. But I mean, guys, we've got some pretty good young talent. Yeah, we do. And um, obviously, I like seeing a guy, Tyler Halliburton. I get to see him in person when I can uh, with the Pacers. He's been playing a good, good role. 
um, great facilitator. Um, I, I think Cam Johnson is, is really taking uh, a step up. I, I don't know if we'll expect that in the NBA season or just, you know, he's kind of that lights out three point shooting guy, but both games watching him uh, certainly shoot some shots and, and um, you know, seeing how the offense somewhat in a lot of ways runs through him. I thought that was really interesting because um, you know, we've kind of just seen him as like that, a really good NBA player, but would never say that he's a star. Right. Uh, but to see him at least getting more touches than I would have guessed was interesting. And then Reeves, good too. Uh, Ant-Man, Anthony, De uh, Anthony Edwards, uh, great stuff too. So yeah, I mean, nothing crazy, but um, I do like, I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, Cam Johnson stays with Brooklyn. Oh yeah. He, he signed with Brooklyn. Um, I, that's going to be an interesting year. I think with more touches with him, it'll be interesting to see him and Bridges kind of be the, the duo uh, with the Brooklyn Nets. And we saw that they were kind of more role players on that Phoenix team, but to see them, kind of take over a franchise it's going to be very interesting because i like both guys i love bridges and i love cam johnson so yeah yeah absolutely we, you know we we get continuously reminded how deep this league is with upcoming young talent like tyrese mm -hmm. Alliburton, for example mm -hmm. someone that i think man he's in he, coming out of college i mean i, I knew he was going to be good but not this good like he's he's a dude uh he's a legit franchise player and him for him to be out there uh, guys like Jalen Brunson, I know, Sean, you love Oh, that. thank you for bringing him up, I Jeff. Know, I, I, was I, 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 out I, I was surprised you didn't bring him up. I was did, literally going to before did, didn't before he shoot? Didn't he in. shoot like 100% from the field? Yes, I was literally about to – like, Jeff, you you and I are on the same wavelength right now. Jalen Brunson, 21 points, oh, 9 to 9 in the field, 5 assists from, against Spain. You you're had damn right I had that pulled up, oh, Jeff. Oh, my God. You're damn right I had that pulled up. You you know I'm ready to talk my oh, Jalen Brunson man. any day of the week, any given time. Dude, you're a legend. Uh, I'm uh, glad. Now I'm glad I brought him up. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you know what? Shout out to Jalen Brunson. He proved a lot of people wrong. He, he really has. He continues to do that. Dude just knows how to play winning basketball. Like, I appreciate top, it. I really do. Top, top three, top five point guard in the NBA? Five. I don't know about three. Yeah, five. he's he. I, I think top five. I mean, point guards. I mean, at ten out, guys are two guards. I mean, but true point guards, man. I'll take Jalen Brunson on my team. He, I, I, Sean, you're right. He, thank you. You're he right. came in like and and, and he, you're and, right. And the thing that's interesting too is you know it's it, it's something you'll just have to get used to saying. <laughs> <Anyway, laughs> you son of a bitch. I know that's I I deserve that. It's all it's all <laughs> jokes. It's all jokes. But you know, like the the thing that's been so impressive, you know, like to me, there's there's three guys that I've been really impressed with: Jalen Brunson, because yep. this is a super young team, and he came in and took the reins right away. Like Steve Kerr, like if you've listened to Steve Kerr at all, he's been oozing talking about like Jalen Brunson. Like he mm -hmm. loves Jalen Brunson. Like the leadership aspects he brings always making the right plays, just being a, you know, just a, a great presence on and off the court. You know, a guy, a, a guy that's just a bona fide Hooper. You know right. what I mean? Like, like teams with Jalen Brunson on it, win games. That just, that's just what happens yep. to me. The other two guys, Anthony Edwards, he's looking like the closer for team USA. I was kind of hoping he would be like, I think, you know, like how dynamic of a scorer he is. Like, I think Anthony Edwards is one of those guys that we can see be a top 10 player in the league in the next couple of years. And, you know, I, I think he's another guy that could get a lot of confidence from this run. And so um, I'm excited to see what he does, but the other guy as well, Aaron Jackson, Jr. Man. I mean, he talk about one of the most overlooked stars in the entire league. I mean, one defensive player of the year, he's as, he, a guy who's so dynamic on the offensive end. I actually, I saw Memphis, during Jaws rookie season, it was it was uh, Memphis, Detroit in, in Detroit. And it was I, it was it was 2019. Like, it, yeah, it was like the end of 2019, right before 2020. This is when Blake was still on was was still on the crew. And I remember just like taking away from that game. Like, yes, obviously, Jaw was special. But the most dominant player on the court that night was Jaron Jackson, Jr. And it right. like specifically when he got things going offensively, like he can shoot it from beyond the arc. He's a guy that can, you know, that can catch lobs going to the rim. Like Jaron Jackson Jr. has a chance to be one of the most like unsolvable problems on both sides of the court in the entire league. And I think if anything, I think these first 25 games without John Morant on the court, 
I think this could potentially be a runway for Jaron Jackson Jr. if he so chooses, if he takes advantage of it. This could be a coming out party for him. I mean, it's not like it's not like without John Morant that this Memphis team is deprived of talent. They still they they're bringing in Marcus Smart into the fold this season. They still have guys like Desmond Bain who can step up and, and take a lot of offensive load. I'm interested to see what he can do, and especially like you talk about a guy that's made for FIBA basketball. I mean, how unfair is it that a guy like Jaron Jackson Jr. gets to block shots over the cylinder? Yeah, <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to Brunson quick, guys. We've said it a million times, but poor Dallas Mavericks, right? No, dumb Dallas Mavericks, dude. Are you kidding <laughs> me? They let that guy – they could have signed him for four years, $64 million. Brunson would have taken it. And they didn't. And they let him oh, walk no. for nothing. The Knicks are laughing to the bank, man. I know we were all – I remember the reaction to that contract. And even myself, I was like, that it's a big number. But if anything, I think it's been I think it's been massively proven. Yeah. That that Jalen Brunson was it was worth every penny. And if anything, the Knicks kind of got a discount. Like before the big contracts really start coming, like they kind of got them at a decent number. Mm -hmm. So and by the way, speaking of uh, speaking of the Knicks, watch out for them with Joel Embiid. Mm. Mm. Imagine if you pair up Jalen Brunson and Joel in the Garden. I mean, guys, if there's any team that has the assets to go get a star to make a big move to to you know to be the team that can pull the trigger on something like that, you talk about the wild card team in this league. I mean, I think it's them. You know, like, I, I don't think they're in the Dame talks because, I mean, obviously they, they, you have Brunson in the building. I don't think you'd want to pair those guys together. I think Brunson is younger, has a longer runway, and, you know, Dame doesn't want to be there from, from what we understand. But at the same time, I mean, this is a this roster looks pretty primed to throw a, to throw a big, like, Embiid in the post there. So, I mean, they've, they've been – they have been hovering – for a long time, waiting to pounce and get their next star. But Prince Joel Philly would have to do a time. massive, a massive rebuild. What's that? Process round two. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, yeah. Process two, electric boogaloo. <laughs> oh, dude! I just need basketball back so bad. Uh, no, this is bad. Yeah, yeah. What? We yeah, what? When we're getting this stupid out of pod, that's when you know. That's when you know we just need hoops back. But guys, it's always fun talking about it. I mean, th this. I think if anything, that this all like all these situations and everything that we've talked about today. If it if it if we can encapsulate anything, this is why the NBA is the most fun league in in sports. Like, what other league during the middle of its off season? You have players coming out right in public on social media, calling their general manager a liar. You have all <laughs> these, like, you have like all this, like, drama and like in playing. You have all this, like, like, there is just so many layers to this league, man. What's better than that? I can't, I, I can't tell you. I really can't. The storyline. No, it keeps it keeps us afloat in August. I'll tell you that. I love it. Yeah, one hundred percent. One more thing. Did you guys see? Uh, did you guys see what the uh, what the first uh, preseason game for the Pistons is going to be? Is it um, Phoenix Suns? It's Phoenix. Phoenix announced they're going to be at least their first preseason game, and I'm gonna I'm gonna assume this is Detroit's too because it's like October second, like right at the beginning of October. It's in LCA. Monty Williams right away going to be facing Frank Vogel in his own uh, coaching his old team. I am fascinated to see, you know, just how that dynamic's going to be. I mean, I know Monty's going to be all class, but I think even for a preseason game, I think he's going to want to come out and get the win. Oh, yeah. It's I bet tickets will be cheap preseason. You guys should consider. Yeah, 100%. Probably going to prob probably enjoy the tickets being cheap while we can because this team will get good. Yeah, here Lions effect. Soon. Lions effect right there. Yeah. Line, good luck getting tickets this year. Yeah. Meanwhile, Troy can still go to Pacers games and get courtside seats for like ten bucks. 
No, those are a little pricey here. I know, but you still get to go get stupid cheap seats. It's still Pacers tickets are ridiculous. Anyway, this has been from Half Court. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Be sure you follow my guys, Jeff and Troy at Jeff Iafrady at Troy Sergey forty four. You can follow me on Twitter at John Half Court. But gentlemen, I'm grateful for you both. It's always good to see you both. Thank you both for being here. Thank you all for being here. We'll catch you guys next time from Half Court. Be sure you're subscribed.